Those words could have been uttered at the top of Everest. Yeah, we're meeting a couple after six who proposed at the top of Everest. Now, where did you propose? I sort of didn't really propose. I mentioned to my intended that it might be a good idea to, uh, well, to, you know, get together, have a family, that sort of thing. Uh, I was in Pisa. We were overlooking the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That's a bit magical, isn't it? it but it's nothing. It's nothing. <laughs> like Mike Davy from Burgess Hill. I can't believe this. He proposed from the top of Mount Everest. And he's talking to us now. Hi, Mike. Hi there. Hi, Richard. Uh, this is absolutely true, isn't it? You climbed to the top of Everest simply so you could propose to your intended. Well, that might be stretching it a bit. I climbed to <laughs> the top of Mount Everest pursuing a very long dream and, and to raise money for uh, Chase Hospice in Guildford. But um, it seemed like a good opportunity to make a romantic proposal to my my poor long-suffering girlfriend who'd, um, who'd, um, who'd waited a long time for it, shall we say. And you, you've, so what, you had a satellite phone and, and you gave her a ring. What time did you get through to her? Uh, UK time, it was about 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> was she, was she uh, glad to hear from you? Well, she, Jane said that uh, when the phone went, she knew straight away it was me, and the first thing she thought was, well, he must be on the summit, because she knew that I'd be phoning about that time um, if I had made it to the top. So her first reaction was, thank God he's done it. Um, you know, we can now think about something else. You know, he's achieved his dream, and um, he won't be going again. And then I completely surprised her by, um, after telling her where I was, um, proposing. And she said... She said yes, thankfully. <laughs> That's just as well, isn't it? We well, didn't want to waste I, I, the trip. Exactly. I don't think she really had any choice, did she, to be honest? Not really. Can I just ask you, were you, were you done on one knee? Is that possible with what you were wearing and all that sort of stuff at no, the top of Everest? I, I have to. Uh, maybe I could claim I was. Now, to be honest, no, I was sitting right on the very top, uh, which is a very windy, cold place, um, with my head in one position so I could maintain the satellite signal. Because, I mean, with the satellite phone, if you, if you turn your head through about three degrees, you can lose the signal. So it would have rather spoiled the moment. So I was kind of fixed in one position, getting rather chilly. But not on one knee. I was sitting down. OK, Mike, can you tell me, because uh, I've never been there, how do you know you're, you're at the top of Everest? Is there a sign there saying, you know, <laughs> welcome to the top of Everest? Well, what there is, there are, uh, and this year particularly, there, I think there must have been some kind of Buddhist festival because there were a huge number of colourful prayer flags. And also there is a slight clue in that you're in the Himalayas and you look around and everything's beneath you, so it's a bit of a giveaway, really. Because, um, I mean, it was a clear day and we could see for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Um, but no, there's a huge amount of prayer flags that the Sherpas take up, and there are sort of other mementos that people leave on top. So it's kind of looks like a bit like a bit of jumble sale, actually. I so gather you, you, you pretty much know where you are. I gather that uh, you know, love the course of true love didn't run that smoothly. You got a bit of frostbite. Yeah, no, I'm very unusually for me because I've done plenty of big mountains before and never had trouble with my feet. But this time my feet got cold very quickly um, and I realised maybe three or four hours from the summit that, I, that my left foot was a big problem. And I almost turned back. But to be honest, I mean, I, this was my second attempt on Everest and it's something that I've been working towards for uh, maybe 10 years. And it was so close. I just thought, well, you know, I think I'll carry on and take the risk. What happened in the first attempt, by the way? First attempt in 2005, uh, on our summit day, about five or 600 vertical metres below the summit, one of my team members uh, had a heart attack and died, Ooh, um, oh. which was uh, obviously a very difficult thing to yeah. deal with. So the team turned around, and uh, fantastically, I was back with two of the members of that team this year and um, climbed the mountain with them. So we kind of, it was, you know, it was emotional, and we, we felt we did it for our friend who died in 2005. You see, the question is why, and, and people will say, well, because it's there. Is that right? Is that why you climbed Everest, because it's there? Really hard to say. I mean, I was inspired by a book I read by Rebecca Stevens about 12, 13 years ago, and I just kind of thought, well, you know, I didn't realise that you didn't have to be Chris Bonington to climb Everest, so I kind of went to base camp, and then I started doing things like Kilimanjaro, and gradually kind of worked my way up until I realised that, yeah, I could, I'd have a, you know, I'd have a chance at Everest, um, and it, and it, to be honest, it just developed into me to this fabulous dream, and, you know, at various times over the last few years, it's been really the most important thing for me, you know, it's been an absolute passion for me to do this. Um, so having it, done it and, and that, kind of you know, having fulfilled that passion, you know, what, what, what happens next? Do, do you get a new <laughs> dream? 
I'm still enjoying achieving the last one, you know, because <laughs> I, I thought I might just think, oh, cause I've, I've, I've wanted to climb various other mountains yeah. before and I've just done them and thought, oh, yeah, okay, that's done now. But yeah. I have to say, I mean, the summit moment was absolutely magical and I'm still kind of bathing in my in my sort of own enjoyment of, uh, of how fabulous that moment was, which kind of helps with my toe. So it kind of gives me a really nice... Um, you know, it makes it makes the whole problem with my frostbite bearable because I achieved my goal. Sure, and also you, you raised, you got up the top of Everest. You raised ten thousand pounds, as you say, for the Chase Children's Hospice charity. That's right. And also you gained a wife. Not a bad day's a work, eh? Yeah, it was it was a it was a good day's work actually. It wasn't bad, was it? Hey, well, it, was, it, was a, it was a day I'll remember. Uh, you're not going to go. You're not going to get married on the top of Everest or anything <laughs> mad like that, are you? No, no. We will. Uh, well, my uh, my fiance will be choosing the location for the wedding, so it'll be some posh hotel in the local area. It'll be somewhere nice. Somewhere on be, the ground. Yeah, somewhere sensible and warm and uh, and clean. Okay, well, I think it's a fantastic story. Thanks for talking to us. Take Cheers, care. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> Oh, this is a bit appropriate, isn't it? We don't normally link up songs with the stuff we've just done, but this is Dr. Hook. When you're in love with a beautiful woman and you're on the top of Everest and you've got a satellite phone, what else is there to do? Darling, will you marry me? <laughs> 